All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be talking about the midpoint rule. And the midpoint rule is another method of approximating the area under a function. And so previously when we've been approximating the area under a function or under a curve, we have been using rectangles with either left or right endpoints. Right, so if you're not familiar with left and right Riemann sums or calculating the area using rectangles with left or right endpoints, feel free to check out our lesson on that topic that I'll have linked here for you to check out. But if you are familiar with them, then you might be familiar with these two graphs here. You'll notice that we have the same function that's over here that we're gonna be working with. But in this first graph, we approximated the area using rectangles and their left endpoints by lining up the upper left-hand corner along our function. And then for our second graph here, we used right endpoints of the rectangles by lining up the upper right corner with our function. And so you can see how this approximation was an overestimation because it's including all this extra area above the curve, and that when we used right endpoints, it was an underestimation because we weren't including some of the area underneath the function. And so then this might lead one to ask the question, what would happen if we used the middle of the rectangle rather than a corner? What if we just used a point right in the middle of our rectangles? And that is what the midpoint rule does. And so if we were going to use the midpoint of rectangles to approximate the area under this function, Let's use the same amount of rectangles we used in these two examples. We'll use four rectangles. So that means that n will be equal to four, n being the number of rectangles that we are going to use. And we're going to calculate the area under this function from zero to eight. And so then if we erase these other graphs over here, we know that we can approximate the area using the following formula. We have delta x times the sum from i equals one to n of the function evaluated at x sub i, right? That is where delta x represents the width of each of our rectangles, and the function evaluated at x sub i represents each of the heights of our different rectangles. And then we know that the width, or delta x, is equal to b minus a divided by n, where b and a correspond to our interval, and n is the number of rectangles we are using, which in this case is four. And so if you look at our interval here, this would be an interval from a to b, which means that our value of a is zero and our value of b is eight. And so if we were to calculate delta x in this scenario, delta x would be equal to eight minus zero divided by four, which would be equal to eight divided by four, which would be equal to two. So we know that the width of each of our rectangles is going to be two. And so if we label our x axis here, we'll have two, four, and six. So I'll label that here. And our rectangles using midpoints will look something like this. We'll have one here, we'll have one here, another one right here, and one final rectangle right there. All right, so now I didn't do a good job of making these equally spaced apart, but they should have equal widths. They should all have a width of two. But notice how instead of using a corner of our rectangles to line up with our function, we are using a point in the middle. Now, they're not perfect the way I drew it, but imagine that the function is going through the middle of each rectangle, or at least the middle of the top part of our rectangles. And so what we would find is that since it's crossing through the middle of the top of our rectangles, that's actually going to line up with the value in between each subinterval, right? So our first rectangle has the width of two. It's going from the x value of zero to two, which means that the midpoint would be at x equals one. And then for our next rectangle, it would be going from two to four, which means that middle point would be three. And then the midpoint of our next rectangle would be at five. And then for our last one, it would be at seven, right? And that would line up with each of our points here. And so these values of one, three, five, and seven that are the x values of our midpoints are going to be our values of x sub i in this case. If we plug these values into our function, we will find the y value or the height of each of our rectangles. And so that's what we wanna sum up in this formula. And so if we use our value of delta x and we use these values of x sub i that we just found, then we'll have that the area is equal to two times the sum of these values of one, three, five, and seven plugged into our function 64 minus x squared. And so we'll have f of one plus f of three plus f of five plus f of seven. And so if we were to plug each of these values into our function, we'll do them one by one here. This will be equal to two times one plugged into our function. 64 minus one squared will be 64 minus one. And so that is equal to 63. 
And then if we plug three into our function, we'll have 64 minus three squared. Three squared is nine, so 64 minus nine would be 55, so we have plus 55. And then we're going to plug five into our function, so we'll have 64 minus five squared, which will be 64 minus 25, and that will be equal to 39, so we'll have plus 39. And then finally, we'll plug seven into our function, and so you'll have 64 minus seven squared, which is 64 minus 49, which will give you 15, so we'll have plus 15. And so if we add all these numbers together, this will be equal to two times 172, which is equal to 344. And so that would be the approximation of the area under this curve using rectangles and midpoints, not using either of the corners, right? We're not using left or right endpoints anymore, we're using a midpoint. And so a reason you might want to use midpoints rather than left or right endpoints is because it's going to be a better approximation because instead of being an exaggerated overestimation or underestimation, it's going to be a lot closer to the actual value of the area under our function because while it's calculating extra area above the function, it's also missing some area underneath the function. And so in a way, these extra areas that we're calculating make up for the area that we're missing. It's not gonna be perfect, right? This is not a perfect approximation of the area under this function, but it's going to be fairly close, right? And so if we were to compare that to previous values we found in a prior lesson when we used right and left Riemann sums for this same function, we found that the right Riemann sum using right endpoints with four rectangles was equal to 272. And then when we use left endpoints, we had that L sub four was equal to 400. Right, and then after we found both of these values, we said that the area is going to be somewhere in between 272 and 400 because this was an underestimation and this was an overestimation. But notice that our value using the midpoint rule is between those two values. We have 344. And so it holds true that using the midpoint rule is going to give us a better approximation than using a right Riemann sum or a left Riemann sum. But maybe you're wondering, well, how good is that approximation? What is the actual area under this function from zero to eight? Well, we can use a definite integral, which gives us the exact area underneath the function to compare to 344. And so let's do that next. Okay, so here's our integral. We have the integral from zero to eight of our function 64 minus x squared dx. And we're going to integrate this and see what the actual area under this function from zero to eight is. And so if we integrate each of our terms here, this will be equal to 64x minus x to the third power divided by three, and that will be evaluated from zero to eight, right? So when you integrate a constant like 64, you just multiply it by the variable that you are integrating with respect to, which in this case is x, right? We are integrating with respect to x. That's what dx tells us. And so we multiplied 64 by x. And then when we integrate x squared, we use the power rule for integration, which tells us to add one to our exponent. So we have x cubed, and then we divide by that new exponent of three. Okay, and so then we're going to evaluate this antiderivative from zero to eight. And so we'll start by plugging in eight. And if we do that, this will be equal to 64 times eight minus eight to the third power divided by three. And then we will subtract plugging zero into this antiderivative. And so we will have 64 times zero minus zero cubed divided by three. And this whole term is just gonna be zero, right? 64 times zero is zero and zero cubed is zero divided by three is still zero. So this is all just zero. We don't need to worry about that term. But if we were to simplify this over here, this will be equal to 64 times eight, which is 512. And then we have minus eight cubed divided by three and eight cubed is also 512. So we will be subtracting 512 divided by three. And so if we were to rewrite this term in terms of thirds, this would be equal to 1536 divided by three. And we would still be subtracting 512 divided by three, right? So we just multiplied 512 by three divided by three to get this number. And then we can subtract our numerators and this will be equal to 1024 divided by three. And so if you were to plug this in your calculator and get the decimal value, you would find that this is equal to 341.3 repeating. 
And so this is the actual area underneath this function from zero to eight. And remember that when we use the midpoint rule, we found that the area was equal to 344. And so look at how close these two values are. This is the actual area, and this is what we found using the midpoint rule. It's only about three off. Compare that to the right or left Riemann sums where we were off by way more than just three, right? We had 272 and 400 as our other approximations. Those are a bit of a ways off from 341.3 repeating. And so the midpoint rule is definitely a better approximation of the area under the curve. And so to really make sure that we understand how to use the midpoint rule, let's look at one more example for this video. All right, so here's our example. We have approximate the area under the function f of x equals x cubed plus one from zero to 12 using three rectangles and the midpoint rule. All right, and so we're told that we're gonna be using three rectangles. And so that means that n is equal to three, right? n is the number of rectangles we are using. And we wanna find the area using this formula that delta x, the width of our rectangles, is gonna be multiplied by the sum from i equals one to n of our function evaluated at x sub i, which represents the height of our different rectangles. And so we'll start by calculating delta x. We know that delta x is equal to b minus a divided by n, and b and a are going to correspond to our interval where a is zero and b is 12. And so delta x will be equal to 12 minus zero divided by three, which is equal to 12 divided by three, which is equal to four. And so we know that the width of each of our rectangles is going to be four. And so if we wanna figure out our values of x sub i in this case, or the x values that will give us the height of each of our rectangles, let's draw a number line. So we're gonna be looking at the values of x from zero to 12. So if I label that on our number line here, we're gonna be looking at zero to 12. We are looking at rectangles that have a width of four. And so using that value of delta x of four, I'm going to add four to zero and then add four again until we get to 12. And so we'll have a mark for four. And if we add four again, we will get eight. And so that will be our next tick mark. And if we add four again, we get to 12. And so now we have our three sub intervals or the widths of our three rectangles. And so we know that our first rectangle is going to span from zero to four. Our second one will span from four to eight, and our third one will span from eight to 12. And so to figure out the midpoints of those rectangles, right, we're using the midpoint rule, we wanna find the value of x in between each of these subintervals. And so the best way to find the midpoint for each of these subintervals is to add up the two bounds and then divide by two. And so for our first interval here, we're gonna have zero plus four divided by two, and that's equal to four divided by two which is equal to two. And so our first midpoint for our first sub interval is two. And then for our second sub interval, we have four plus eight divided by two, and that will be equal to four plus eight, which is 12 divided by two, and that is equal to six. And so our next midpoint for our second sub interval will be six. And then for our last sub interval, we're gonna add eight and 12 and divide by two. So we'll have eight plus 12 divided by two, and eight plus 12 is 20, and divided by two will be equal to 10, and so that means that our last midpoint is 10. All right, so now if we clean up our work here a little bit, we can use these midpoints or these values of x sub i that we found to calculate the area under this function from zero to 12 using the midpoint rule. And so we'll have that the area is equal to delta x, which we found is four, so we're going to have four times the sum of the values of x sub i, two, six, and 10, plugged into our function. So we'll have f of two plus f of six plus f of 10, right? We plugged each of these midpoints into our function. And so this will be equal to four times two plugged into this function. So we'll have two cubed plus one, and then we will add six plugged into this function. So we'll have six cubed plus one, and then we have 10 plugged into this function. So we will have plus 10 cubed plus one. And then if we clean up our work here, we'll have that this is equal to four times, two cubed is eight, so eight plus one is nine. And then we will add that to six cubed plus one, and six cubed is 216, so plus one would be 217, so we'll have 217. And then we will add that to 10 cubed plus one, and 10 cubed is 1,000, and 1,000 plus one is 1,001. And then if we add these three numbers together, this will be equal to four times 
1,227, which is equal to 4,908. And so that's the approximate area under this function from zero to 12 using three rectangles and the midpoint rule. All right, and so then just like we did last time, let's compare it to the actual value of the area under this function. Let's solve the integral of x cubed plus one from zero to 12. All right, so here's our integral. We have the integral from zero to 12 of x cubed plus one dx. And this is the area we found using the midpoint rule, right? This is our approximation of 4,908. And let's compare that to the evaluation of this integral. And so if we integrate each term here, this will be equal to x to the power of four divided by four plus x. And that will be evaluated from zero to 12, right? So we use the power rule of integration on x cubed. And so we added one to the exponent to get four, and then we divided by that new exponent of four. And then when we integrate one or a constant, we just multiply by x, and so we have x. All right, and so let's plug in 12 into our antiderivative here, and then we will subtract the value of plugging in zero. And so this will be equal to 12 to the fourth power divided by four plus 12, and then we will subtract zero to the fourth power divided by four plus zero. And so once again, this last term is just going to be zero because zero to the fourth power is zero, divided by four is still zero, and then we're just adding zero. And so all of this is zero. And so we just have to focus on these two terms. We have 12 to the fourth power, that's gonna be a big number, divided by four. And so this is equal to 20,736 divided by four. That's what 12 to the fourth power is, if you were to plug that in your calculator. And then we're still adding 12. And thankfully this number is divisible by four. And so we get a nice answer that this is equal to 5,184 plus 12. And that is equal to 5,196. And so this is the actual area under this function from zero to 12. And so you can see how that compares to the approximation we found using the midpoint rule. Now it's a little further apart than it was before, but that's because this is a much larger area than we worked with in the previous problem. Last time we had a total area of about 341, but this time we're looking at an area in the 5,000s. So this is pretty close considering how large the area is. If you were to use a right or a left Riemann sum, it would be way further off than 4,908 is from the actual area. All right, and so the takeaway here is that the midpoint rule is a pretty good approximation for the area under a curve. And so with that, that's all I had for this lesson on the midpoint rule. If you wanna see some more example problems where we approximate the area under a function using the midpoint rule, you can check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.